I thank you for being here tonight. And I trust you've had a good week, and I agree with you. It is chilly outside, not cold yet. That is still yet to come. And anybody got frost where you live yet? Some plain in Fishersville they got frost. We, we've not seen a drop out near the mountain. Interesting. Okay. But uh, we've not seen any so far, so our grass isn't dying yet. <laughs> but anyhow, we are glad you're here. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for those online tonight that may be watching, and uh, we trust you have a good week. Time I hear that uh, that song because he lives. I think of Harold. I do too. And do remember him in prayer. We'll say more about him a little bit later, and Ann as well, and so forth. But anyhow, pray for both of them in a very special way. Complete in Him is the title of the book of. Uh, Colossians, and uh, we have been doing a series on the book of Colossians, and we are looking at the title as our fifth message in the series, It's Time to Come Back Home, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, actually. We begin this chapter, portion of scripture in chapter 1, just last week. <clears throat> Paul writes to the church at Colossae and says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Twice he uses the word reconcile. He likes that word. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable <clears throat> and unreprovable in his sight. So tonight we uh, won't finish actually this portion of scripture. I've got some other things to look at that I want to center on. But uh, I shared with you last week the cross is what Paul here is bragging on. And rightly so. Think about it. Had it not been for the cross, your sins wouldn't be bought and paid for. And our salvation and redemption was settled not only at the cross, but also at the empty grave. It was confirmed who he was in the resurrection. And it proved that he was everything that he said he was and who he was. And I thank God for that. But the cross literally has been the tool that's one day going to lead us back home. And uh, actually, the minute you got saved, you started heading the right direction the minute you got saved. Is that right? Amen. I mean, we were out of fellowship with God, completely a broken fellowship. And the minute we came to the cross and the Christ of the cross, and we believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for me and for us, the moment we did that, trusted in him we begin our journey home. We've been journeying home now. Good night. I've been journeying on the journey for 50, 53 years. And uh, it will eventually conclude, I will assure you. But Paul loves the word reconcile or reconciliation or, that's a doctrine, reconciliation. To change or mend or repair. And particularly, we shared with you last week, in regards to relationships. Couples having problems can reconcile. Uh, sometimes parents and children, <laughs> sad to say in this day and time, need some reconciliation. Sometimes friends that have disagreed, fought, um, had problems over the years, find some reconciliation through a mediator. Uh, it's true of sometimes co-workers <laughs> have been on the jobs that didn't get along. Bosses have had to bring them in. And to talk to them, that either they uh, sit up, shut up, straighten up. They're going, they're not going up. They're going down. They're going out. <laughs> but uh, so there's all kinds of mending sometimes of bro broken relationships that need to be mended. I have actually, uh, not very often, thank God, had to deal with church members that weren't getting along internally within our church or within the ministry. That's always sad. Uh, but that's exactly what Paul brags about. The cross reconciled us back to God. That which was broken because of sin was reconciled through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And I thank God that it was. Last week we shared with you that if a man's sitting over here, God's here, and the podium is sin, we'll make it that, then man here cannot get to God because sin's in the way. It's broken the fellowship. The minute Adam sinned in the garden, what was the first thing that happened? God came to Adam. Adam didn't come to God, by the way. That's always the case, isn't it? That's never changed. You didn't come to God. God came to you. Right. And never forget that. You have very little to do in your salvation other than thank God when he came, you listened, you hearkened, and you obeyed and uh, trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. So man here separated by sin from God, something must be done with this sin. And when Jesus paid in full your sin debt on the cross, the evidence being the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it satisfied the Father in heaven, the moment that transpired, this sin, when you trust Christ, is removed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Thus the separation, the petition, is removed completely, and we are considered through salvation, reconciled, rejoined, mended, if you would, with him. And I thank God for that. So, we're looking at what reconciling does. Well, reconciling power of the cross is what Paul is bringing to our attention in these verses. The cross is a reconciled on uh, the cross. When you consider the cross, he took our sin. He paid your sin debt. He paid your and my way to heaven absolutely in full. you got to understand, some churches teach you to sort of lay down an installment plan. You say, you really believe that? Yeah. Any church that preaches any dab of works or baptism, that means Jesus wasn't enough. Right. Think about it. Either he's mm -hmm. all you need, you don't need baptism, you don't have to have a church, you don't have to have anything but his forgiveness and his salvation. And anything added or subtracted away from Christ means Christ is not enough, regardless of how you look at it, all right? But I'm great, grateful to God he is enough. Now, what was one of the teachings going on in this church? Why is God leading Paul to address not only the subject of salvation, but how to, how to go to heaven? How to find God. How to be brought back and reconciled to God. Because they had a Gnostic teaching there. That taught that you could only come to God not by the blood of Christ. Jesus wasn't enough. Literally, that's what they believed. He wasn't enough. You had to have a certain amount of intellectual knowledge. And through knowledge, through uh, education, through your reading and research, eventually, Gnosticism believed you could be then considered by God to come back in his fellowship. Think about that. That'd be like me saying, hey, you come here with a PhD, God will consider having you in his family. Nonsense, isn't it? Mm. Well, I'm glad it's not education. Most of us, or some of us in this room, would fail miserably. All right? I hated school. If it was education, I wouldn't even want to have any new salvation. Trust me. I never was a school lover. Now, I love college, though, but... Uh, a whole different reason. I had a goal, had a purpose, and God was in that. So it made all the difference in the world. But anyhow, Gnosticism. Verse 20. Notice what he says. And having made peace through his blood. Aren't you glad you're at peace with God? And I'm grateful as we pray for the land today. God bless our hearts. She was all shook up and torn up. And we called just when whatever was going down. I don't even know that. We just had to hang out. We just come back on the doctor's point at UVA. But she said, would you just pray, preacher? I'm calling you. I, no, I was going to call you. And then you called. You rang my number. And I said, well, God's time is always right. And uh, so having another road, I had prayer for her. But the thing she needed most was the peace of God and uh, some things going on. So anyway, I'm grateful I have a peace with God. But I'm grateful I can also know the peace of God when trials come, surgeries, death. Uh, sickness, uh, problems in families. Thank God for the peace that passeth all understanding. Now, how do we have it? The Bible says, through the blood of his cross, he made peace through us, for us. Aren't you grateful for that? I am. Mm -hmm. So, when we think about the reconciling power of the cross, we shared with you last week, there's a conquest that Paul writes about that has been demonstrated. 
having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things, not some, all things unto him, by him I say, whether they be things of, in earth or things even in heaven. Can I just simply tell you, the word peace means to come and bind something together. To bind together. And uh, when you speak of a, uh, a broken bone, uh, we sometimes will have broken bones. And we asked you last week, how many have ever had that? And thank God so far I've been very fortunate and not have any. But what do you do with a broken bone? You put it back together. You uh, have to put it back together and then it can repair. Usually, normally, if healthy, uh, repair itself. And it's considered then mended. Well, that's exactly what the blood of Jesus Christ gave to us through the peace of Christ at the cross. He mended with us what was broken. We were anything but at peace with God. And we're going to talk about that tonight when we look at another word that he addresses for all sinners. Something that you hardly hear anybody talk about today. What's the average thought? Let me ask the congregation tonight. What's the average thought that everybody has? Every sinner, I don't care if he's a drug addict, I don't care if he's a drunk, I don't care what his sins are, okay? What is the average thought concept of God when they think of God? Come on. You know what it is. God loves us, and he does. But because they are, have been so preached about the love of God, and I'm not against that, it has warped the mentality of the average sinner. Why? Because they cannot reconcile God loving me and I, I would ever be cast into hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You get the mis misconstruing or misconception of the majority. Of, that's why the concept, the theology today of almost everyone, if there's a heaven, all of us are going to go there. Why? All because God loves me. Do you understand the misconception? And what Paul hits on in these texts that we're going to look at tonight tells us you are anything, yes, you're love, because God and God alone truly can do this, love his enemies. But we are anything but being a part of his family before we get saved and born again. We need to understand that. We're separated by sin and from God, and our fellowship with God had been broken <coughs> And we needed the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ to put us back together again. We showed you this picture last week. Sin separating us from God. And because of sin, if man does not come to God, or I should say God doesn't come to him, and he accepts what God does, then and there he will ultimately pay his own sin debt in the lake of fire. Not a popular subject today. I was telling my wife, I, I have never... It amazes me. Today, preachers that do believe in hell don't no longer use the word hell. They no longer use the fire of hell. Can I tell you the new term preachers are using? Because it just sounds better. Death. You're separated to death. And I understand Romans 623. That is exactly what it means. But if you run down that word death, it means to be separated from God eternally. And there's only one place that you're going to do that in hell. Are you with me? That's the only place God is not and will never be. His grace will never be there. Mercy will never be found there. The love of God will never be there. In fact, everyone there will hate and detest and be clawing at each other. They hate each other so much. And those who are friends, if they even can remember those relationships, we're not certain about that. They will certainly, if they have, and we know they have a memory, because when you look at Luke 16, 24, the text of the, the parable of the rich man, he had a memory in hell. Remember? How about my brothers? Well, he remembered his brothers were still living. But I think literally men and women who die and go to hell will blame people all around them in life. You're the reason I hit. I went. You're the one that gave me the drink. You're the one that gave me the weed. You're the one that gave me the drug. You're the one that caused me to lust. You're the one that caused me. They'll blame it. Isn't that always been men's? Downfall, we love to blame others for our faults and our flaw and for our sin. Started in the garden, didn't it? And that's, it's never changed. And I think hell's going to be full of that. Can you imagine a place like that? Good night. 
That wouldn't be a place I'd want to go. Look again at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So, he says the blood did it all. I'm a blood-bought preacher. Mm -hmm. I, make, I try to make much of the blood throughout our ministry. I always did a sermon every so often on the blood because it's being forgotten. Uh, there's so many that want a bloodless, we'll call it bloodless religion, or bloodless Christianity. And I remember a good night back in the uh, 70s, right after I got saved, Methodist, certain Methodist churches, removed blood from their hymn books, all the blood songs. But man, I'm grateful our, our hymn book, and I'm talking about a song book now, that this is the hymn, the true hymn book. Uh, it's all about him, amen? But, the hymn book is loaded with songs. And I'm grateful for the old hymns of the faith. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. There's power in the blood of Jesus. On and on it goes about the blood of Jesus Christ. How important it is. How vital it is to our salvation. you got to understand, had Jesus been shot, he wouldn't have been our Savior. Had a bow killed Jesus, he couldn't be our Savior. Anybody agree with that? Why? Because too many prophecies said he had to be nailed. He had to have pierced hands. I find it uh, it's so interesting how meticulous in detail our God is about everything. Think about it. If Jesus had been born, I don't really know when the Roman Empire started conquering uh, Greece and became the world power. But you understand, if he came under the, the uh, Alexander the Great or Greece's power, they, they didn't mm -hmm. practice. They, there was no crucifixion. Romans invented crucifying. Are you with me? So isn't it amazing? Don't it amaze you how perfect God's timing always is? Yes. Never late. Never early. Always. Always. As I told the inmates out there in the revival the other Sunday. Always. He's always. You can't take it to the bank. Cash the check. He's always right on time. Always. And I thank God for that. Well, the blood's important. What kind of blood? Purchased our peace. Well, let me tell you a couple things. I'm a, this is free tonight. This isn't this wasn't planned, but I had to talk about the blood for a little while tonight, all right? Because I thank God for his blood. Amen. And his blood's not like your blood. All right. His blood is different from everyone that's ever came into live in this world. You say, I you really believe that. I really do. I'm a nut about the blood, all right? I believe his blood was completely different than any of yours because yours is tainted by sin. So was mine. But his was sinless blood. Okay, it makes a difference in his blood. So, what does it mean? All right, let me give you a couple thoughts about the blood. Number one, when I thought about the blood, it was planned blood. You say, what do you mean planned blood? Well, did God say, oops, I didn't know Adam and Eve was going to do that in the garden? You think that's what God did that day? How in your life? The Bible tells us now we're cued later in the New Testament about it. All right? Uh, because some people could look at Genesis and some have even thought that. Literally, when they start reading, well, man, God didn't see this coming, did he? Man, look at him. He created man. Boy, he had to be disappointed. Well, he was disappointed that he did, they didn't choose God above the devil and above sin. All right? But, it was planned blood. What do I mean? Before the foundation of the world, the Bible says, God had ordained Christ to come. To come for what? To shed his blood. Amen? I'm grateful God planned. Isn't it amazing the plan of God? You and I would mess messed it up horribly had we been God. I would have. All right? Uh, I... I'll just be honest with you. I probably said that he had to work so much. He had to be this and do this and do this and do this. But think about how simple salvation's plan is. Think about it. What everybody possesses in their heart is what saves people. Well, Jesus doesn't save. But within us, we must have one commodity. What is the commodity that we must have? Come on, tell me. Acts chapter... Goodness gracious, what am I thinking about? Hmm. Come on. Sermon Paul 
No, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. What does that mean? And here's the problem with so many people again about the love of God. They got a problem there. Second problem they have is because when they read or they hear preachers preach, that's by faith, that's belief. Oh, I believe in God. How many of you have ever heard somebody tell you that? Okay. My wife and I do witness when we're in, in route between prisons and restaurants and other places. I couldn't tell you how many people, when I ask them, do you know, is he back? I'm sure you go to heaven. Or my wife witness to him, give him a try. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Why do you know you're okay? Oh, I believe in God. Think about it. I got news for you. The devil believes that there's a God. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. The Bible says in James, he goes further. Yeah, he goes a lot big further step. The Bible says that the devil believes and trembles about God. Yeah. I don't see too many trembling that say they believe in God today. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, it was a planned blood. He prepared it before the foundation of the world for his son to die a specific way. And he had to go on the cross. And it had to be a cross for him to be crucified. And then what other kind of blood? It's perfect blood. As I said earlier, it's sinless blood. Different than you and I. He was totally without sin. The sinless one became the sinful one. So we, the sinful ones, could become sinless ones one day. Man, what a plan. God thought it all, didn't he? Perfectly thought it all. So it's perfect blood. Then it's powerful blood. What I mean by that? Hey, the blood of Jesus Christ has the power to save the most wicked individual. Wretched. Godless. I'm glad I can offer to inmates that may have multi-murders, deaths that they may have committed. I just know I preached to some murderers because they told me so. That's what they're in for. But they did it when they were young, when they were stupid. Not to say some can't be older and be stupid and not too bright. But uh, can I just tell you, I'm glad my gospel, my Jesus, and his blood has the power to cleanse the worst and the filthiest sinner. You want to know how powerful the blood of Christ is? Hitler murdered over six million of God's people. And yet, had he turned to Christ, my Savior would have saved him. And the power of the blood of his coming from his veins shed that hour would have been sufficient to cover, to cleanse forever those over six million deaths of God's people that he chose to commit. Think about it. That's powerful blood, ain't it? Boy, I'm glad the blood of Jesus Christ. And it keeps on cleansing. It restores our fellowship on a daily basis. As we mess up, if we fess up, then God cleans us up. Amen? And restores and repairs the damage. Sometimes sins creeping into our lives. Or just sins of, of omission can sometimes take its toll. So it's powerful blood. Then it's purchasing blood. What purchased your redemption, your salvation? The blood of Jesus Christ did. Are you aware, of course, many believe this. I actually believe this. I'm not, not going to fight about it. Not a big, well, it is a big deal to me. But anyway, I actually believe God has the blood of Jesus in heaven. All right? I believe he kept it. I believe he got it there. And uh, I could give you chapters and verses why I believe that, but that's not part of my sermon tonight. But why would, he, would, he, would, he, would it be there? Because it's the payment for our salvation. It's special blood. It's different blood. And uh, had he not shed his blood, we wouldn't be saved. Think about it. Without the shedding of blood, there's no what? Remission. Remission, forgiveness, whatever you want to call it, of sin. So it's through the blood. Yes, he had to die, but he had to die a certain way. And he had to shed his blood. That's why I hated that song, even though I like the words to it. Only one phrase eats me alive every time I hear it. If it's sung according to the words of the song. Um, oh man, Steve Green, Steve Green song about the blood. And in that song, he said, and his blood was spilled out. No, sir. No. Spilling is by accident, always. Any child spills milk, 
on the floor, he did it by accident. Unless he's just a little brat and he just does this, all right? And there's a lot of them I've, I've heard about. But uh, when you spill something, it's always by what? Accident. Always. And so thank God for the blood. It was purchasing blood. It's the payment. God, the Father, demanded to satisfy the price of salvation as well as to satisfy his holy demands of what was required to cover, to cleanse, and take care of your and my sin. Oh, what a Savior. And oh, what a God we serve. Amen and amen. So it was um, purchasing blood. It was precious blood. Why? Man, it came from a, a one that the Bible says is most precious. Jesus. Think about it. How would you like to go and be treated with humiliation, spit upon, nailed, spear to the side, uh, buffeted in his face, and everything he took that day, that those hours of agony that he suffered, was because of your sin, not his. The innocent died for the guilty. Okay? And yet he was good to do that. Did he know about it when he came? Oh, absolutely. He knew with the Father before the foundation of the world. So I don't know about you. He's precious to me. Okay? He's the most special person in my life. The second would be my wife. And if she don't treat me better, that might change. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, she treats me well. I'm only joking. But anyhow, so it's precious blood. What other kind of blood is it? It's pardoning blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's forgiving blood. There's no remission, as we quoted a moment ago from both Hebrews and another passage. There's no remission apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful for that. And then also the Bible teaches that it is protecting blood. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, the witnesses overcame through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's power in it. But there's also protection in it. I'm glad God's not going to have anything happen to me until he's ready. Until it's my time. Does that make sense? I'm protected by God. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go out here with a guy with a 45 on his side and slap him upside the head and say, I dare you to shoot me! I'm not that stupid. <laughs> then God probably say, oh, you, you made the mess, I'm going to lift the lift the protection from you and let him shoot you because you're an idiot. But anyway, if God uses the word idiot, maybe, maybe not. But anyway. <laughs> but anyway, protecting blood. They overcame by the blood. And then I'm grateful for this last thought God gave me, and that is it's permanent blood. Amen. What do I mean by that? Hey, it was suffice and sufficient for the entire world. You don't understand the blood of Jesus Christ could cleanse the entire world, and the whole world could be saved if yeah. it wanted to be. If they were willing to be, they could all be going to heaven. They're not. Our majority of them won't, okay? I actually believe there will be several hundred million when Jesus comes that will be raptured. I do not believe there's any no billions, okay? That's just me looking at Scripture and thinking about the situation. But it's permanent blood. What do I mean by permanent? The blood of Jesus Christ was enough for one to be saved. One payment, one for all. One for all time. It satisfied completely God's righteous demands for your salvation and mine. Don't ever treat the blood of Jesus Christ like it. Don't ever just, eh, just another sermon on the blood. No, it's vital. It's important that we love and thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because had it not been shed the way it was, and all, you and I wouldn't be saved tonight. We wouldn't be homeward bound. We embark, we put it this way. The cross is a proof that there is no link to which the love of God, listen to this, will refuse to go in order to win men's hearts. Isn't that true? Study, go home and study the crucifixion of Christ. Everything that went down in about 24 hours of time. I mean, the guy was treated unmercifully, buffeted, sped upon, stripped of his garments in his loincloth, which means basically he was naked as far as Hebrews was concerned. They made him naked, 
for more sheer embarrassment and humiliation as he was dying for the very ones that stripped him. Think of that. For the very ones that crucified him, the hammer, the one that hammered the nails. Maybe there was a man holding him, another man just making sure he was accurate with the driving of the nail. Jesus was dying and loving both of those sorry rascals that drove the nail through his hands. But it's more amazing to me than anyone that he did all of that for me. Amen. Think about it. And I'm grateful that he did. Guy King, I have several of his commentaries, and he's an old, old preacher. He was an alliterator preacher. I really like him. <clears throat> but the trouble in the world, he said, is the consequence of sin and the blood and the salvation from sin will be the remedy whereby the maladjusted joints of the natural world will once again be set right again. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, it's the blood of Jesus that gets us back where we need to be. And that's true, isn't it? It's what God chose to use and to give and to do so that we could be re-reconciled with God said this before, I'll say it again. You cut this book any page and it always will bleed. It's everywhere in the scripture. We're introduced to it in the book of Genesis, are we not? Mm -hmm. The garden scene of Adam and Eve when something, probably a lamb, was became the clothing to cover what their sin had resulted in. You see it in Cain and Abel. You see it in Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. You see, I mean, there's, I mean, it's everywhere. Ruth and Boaz. It's in there. It's in the book of Ruth. And then when you get to the New Testament, man, it's constantly on and on. And when you get to the epistles, every time you turn around, Paul, James, John, somebody is going to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's that, that important. It's that vital for our salvation. So thank God when we cut the book. It does bleed, though it's hated by the world. Romans 5, 6 through verse 10 says these words, Paul again writing, But when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for a righteous man, a good man, or even a godly man, will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man would even dare to die. But God, and I know I've quoted this so many times in plans of salvation. I still do. Every invitation I almost use this verse. That, but God commended. That word means demonstrate, prove, showed. His love towards us, that's sinners. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood. Now we shall be saved. From the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay? See, the death paid for your salvation. The resurrection guarantees you're going to same heaven and be raised just as he was. All right? All vital importance. It's all the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection. Not just the death. It is burial and resurrection. Amen? How many of you have ever heard testimonies, and I've said this here before, and you know, over there, and I've said in prison as well. How many of you have ever said, when, when somebody asks you uh, about your salvation, oh, let me tell you uh, how I found Christ. Or let me tell you how I came to Christ. Can I tell you, all those are wrong. You didn't come to Christ. He came to you. You didn't find him. He found you. Now granted, you didn't have to come when he came to you. Because he came to me multi-times at B&W with those gospel tracks. Oh, I knew. I knew I knew he was after me. Trust me. I did know that. And every one of them began speaking to my heart. Every one of them pricked a different area of my life where I saw myself just sinful and undone and needing God, and certainly needing what Christ could bring in my life. But I, I didn't find Christ. Thank God he found me. I didn't come that night to him, but praise God, he came to me. I wasn't looking for him, 
Well, he sure was a looking for me, and so with you as well. I wasn't even longing him, but boy, he was longing for me. Aren't you grateful to God for that? Not interested at all in spiritual things when I went to work at BMW. And I wasn't in reading all the tracts, really, other than I would read them. And uh, they impressed me, and um, they certainly were sowing seeds of life that had not yet been harvested with God. But uh, I wasn't interested in him, but thank God he was interested in me. Not desiring him, he desired me. Not loving him at all. Anything but the but that. But he was loving me. Not planning on coming to him, but thank God, because he came to me. I eventually came to me. And I came to him. Amen? You understand that Christianity, because of that, is different from all, I mean, literally, every cult, Every, every religion in the world has ever existed. All right? What's different about Christianity than all the religions of the world? Check them out. Okay? Hinduism. Shintoism, which is in Japan, and, and I guess maybe some Chinese. The Asian, Asian area of the world. Oh, uh, Mormonism. And I know Mormons are, are, can be clean, good people. Frank and honest with you. Sad to say, some of them live better than some Christians. That's right. Okay? Or at least professing Christians. What were you going to say? Our Savior lives. Our Savior lives. That's one, yes. And that's very, that's the greatest one of all. But there's another one, and that is simply this. Christianity is the only faith, not a religion. It is a faith, not a religion. That's right. But when you compare our faith with other religions, the biggest difference is all the others their gods. Uh, Islam is another big one. That's growing very rapidly in the world. Every last one of them teaches a God that must be appeased. Our God's already been appeased. You know what appeased him? The blood of Jesus Christ. You with me? Christianity says God comes to us. All false religion we come to God. Big difference. Huge difference. And that's a problem. And that's why man fights at that. Resists that. Because the typical man, and I'm using the people in general, don't want a God to reach down to them. They want to reach up to God. And so that's what religion does. It brings God down to them. Because they are the initiator. Make sense? That's what religion does. That's what Islam's all about. Hey, you kill infidels to get to please God. Their God. Their version of God. And uh, so, it is a vast difference. Religion always is man reaching up. While Christianity has always been God taking the initiative, reaching down to us. False religion, man appeases God, their God, works, offerings, sacrifices, even Satan worship, which will take place big time in this country, Halloween night. And innocent babies will die around the globe with Satan, Satan's worship. Some women will die, depending on the circumstance. Uh, it's very wicked. But anyway, don't want that done. But hey, can you, can you find this proof in your Bible? All the time. Anybody remember Elijah on the mountain? Remember the Bell Prophets? <coughs> remember that? Remember the story? He basically said, hey, you uh, Bell Prophets, hundreds of you, hey, go ahead and help yourself. Call fire down from your God. You remember when he didn't answer? What did they do? Anybody remember? They took out their knives and began cutting themselves. Anybody know why they did that? They did that believing they were appeasing Baal with offering their blood to him. You understand that? <clears throat> so it's always been, false religion has always been wanting to appease God, man trying to do it. Remember Cain and Abel, it goes all the way back to Genesis. Same principle, false religion was born in the garden. Okay? Cain began the first false religion. What was it? What do you do? Abel came, made the sacrifice. Get that phone call right now. Right. I, I know that. Cain 
Offered to God what? What did he offer to God? Did he put himself out there? No. What did he offer? Come on. Y'all know the story of Cain and Abel. What did he offer to God? He offered the garden and stuff. That's exactly right. Why? Because it's false religion because that which he sowed, that's which he fertilized, that's which, that which he harvested with these hands of his own. He said, I'm giving you what I've done. As to where Abel could only follow the true way to God and offer what God had done. Abel offered a lamb God created, a lamb that God gave. All right? Wasn't anything to do with his hands other than the blood that he had to shed. But it was the blood that was different, that made it all different. So, anyway, uh, I just want you to understand there's a vast difference between Christianity and <clears throat> uh, false religion. Okay? Now, let me close with this last point very quickly. I hope I'll finish this. I want you to see the control he displays. What do I mean by control? I like that little children's song. I think we still ought to sing it. Again. He's got the whole world in his hands. He still does, folks. You wait till I shit. I, I'm amazed. I, I don't even have to go online and look any stuff anymore. It just comes to me now because I've been all over the Internet. I got an email just yesterday. I was... Uh, uh, I showed it to her in the doctor's office and I said, tell me this ain't good. On the very sermon I'm preaching Sunday, something just this week happened for the first time in history with these nations. Okay? okay. I'm telling you. I, I'm not saying he's coming in my lifetime. I'm not a date setter. But I'm telling you one thing. It is definitely 11.59 p.m. for the world. And I believe that with all my heart. And I sure like Whatever he wills, it's okay. But the control he displays, everything I've been giving you just shows me his power to control everything, every detail. Man, puny man, oh, uh, Russia invaded uh, the Ukraine and, and it's called Putin. No, it's a God thing. Are you with me? I'm not saying God's a God of war, even though he has been. But it's, it's because he's in charge of it. All who are ordained in power. If Camilla, Camilla, whatever her name is, I know. I'm saying you say that, but anyway. If she becomes president, I'm saying she will. Praying, I can't pray different. I've got to pray for God. God's in control. He's got a plan. But if she does, don't fret. Don't worry. God's got a plan. Okay? So we got to look at it. And he is in control. Trust me. Yep. And with all the stuff I've been preaching over what the past several months <clears throat> on the signs that are constantly increasing and everything, you've got to believe in the control of God, that he's ever sovereign watching the affairs of man. Look at the control that he talks about in verse 20. By him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. What is that verse really speaking about? He's in charge. He's in charge of everything there, and he is certainly in charge of everything he created and that is alive and well on Mother Earth. And that's exactly what he's saying. I'm in control. He's in control of creation, is he not? You better, you better thank God your lucky stars he's watching over his handiwork. All right? Because if he wasn't, we'd be in a mess. As I preached a couple weeks ago, Man, if, if uh, uh, he took his hand off of the world that he created, trust me, it would find somewhere to wreck. I mean, it's bad enough with him in control. Mankind sees to that. Look at what he says in Colossians 1 and verse 6 through verse 17, going backwards again of what he said to me, I remind you. By him were all things what? Created, created. not evolved. Created, that are in heaven, <clears throat> that are in earth, Visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him. Get this next three words. And for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things, what? Super glued together. Just God's in charge. Christ is in charge. God is in control. This is his world. 
You haven't been asked, where do you think this world's going to? Where do you think this world's coming to? I got, I got the answer. It's coming to him. Paul writes about it in the book of Romans. The earth is groaning, and trust me, it's groaning more than it ever has. Why? Because it can't wait to get back under the control, complete control, without evil, sin, the devil, and so forth, where the Creator takes charge of this globe completely once again. And that will happen in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the millennial reign, or else after the second coming of Christ when he completely eradicates the earth as a whole and remakes it over into a new world. All right? But the world is growing. That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> and when you think about this creation of ours, I hate a lot of things about the world, but I don't hate creation of the world. And I don't hate his creation. Think about what he's getting ready to do. The divine artist. I mean, there's nobody that can paint it like it. I've seen, we were, we were in a doctor's office then, and had a beautiful fall picture on the wall. But I'm going to be honest with you, it couldn't touch the hem of the garment to what you really see when you're driving. Yeah. Or what these, the best cameras God's ever invented in the world, and man still can't match. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many pixels they put in, put out there. Photography cannot match what these eyes can see if they're 2020 and good. But man, he's getting ready to do the greatest act that I love every year. And then after that, I like the next season. Why? I love it. I hope we get a lot. I love it to snow. Out at our place, it is so peaceful, solid, and quiet in the woods. There's nothing. You don't hear anything. It even muscle, muzzles even those loud crotch rockets that I despise. They'd open up, yeah, coming way out on the highway. You can hear them dumb things. Can I tell you what? Hey, I'm glad Harleys are a little bit quieter back there, Roger. Usually. Most of unless they 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 they, they got their big pipes and all this stuff with the, the, the motorcycle games and all that, what they do to them. But anyhow, I'm just gonna say thank God for what I'm, i I love creation. I love the rivers, the mountains. Good night. I love the mountains. And uh, I even love the ocean. I love walking on the ocean with Diane of an evening. Okay? And hearing the seagulls chirping or doing whatever they do. And Casey getting to see a dolphin or uh, one of those critters out there in the water going over, up and over. Uh, beautiful. Love it. Very peaceful. Well, who, who, who did all that? God did. Who's in control of all of that? God does. We have, uh, we have two little babies and two mamas. Now, well, one mama, and I, the other one was probably born last year, and he lost his babies, I'm guessing, that live almost in our front yard, live in our whole yard. In fact, when I came back from the hospital, that's a noon today. One was standing right in my, my driveway. The littlest one was over to the left, and three was up at, in the woods just had crossed our driveway. But they come in. My wife, my wife we're going to try to tame them. Well, not tame them. We're going to try to feed them next year when the new babies come. We're going to try to see. I, have anybody seen some of those? Photos and, and video of these guys that's able to get. I mean, there is one guy that's got 13 deer in his front yard, and the biggest buck you've ever seen in your life, you wouldn't even think it would get anywhere near him. He eats apples out of his hands. <laughs> you can't make up that kind of photography, all right? And I think, ah, oh, I'd love to be able to do that. I think yeah. you're so cute. The little, those little babies, when, they're, when they first start walking and they got their little spots all over them and they're so tiny, they're so blessed cute. Mm, makes me want one. But uh, anyway, they don't stay that way long, amen? It's more like a puppy dog, but anyway. All right, not enough. So, I don't hate that, but don't you hate what's happening in the world? A lot of it. Uh, when you think about sin, the running rampant, when you think about the system and the scheme of things, which is basically, we don't need God, we don't want God, and they basically have said that. Pretty much worldwide, to be frank and honest with you, okay? And uh, so it's sort of sad. Removing God from literally everything. But I, the one who created it all is also the same one in control of it all. And I'm grateful to God. Amen. Not only is he in control of, con, uh, of uh, bleh, creation. Thank you, Judy. He's also in control of condemnation. That's what I mean. Best thing I can come up with. I'm glad my God that he controls the world He's also the epitome of self-control within himself. What am I talking about? What are you talking about, preacher? 
I'm grateful I serve a God that is so long-suffering. It's not even funny. Can I tell you what I do with a lot of people in America that I detest by their stands and their uh, horrible ways? I'd already, they'd already be in hell if I was God. So would you. You'd already put them in hell too, by the way. Yeah. Most of us in this room. I'm, I'm amazed. I marvel constantly at the patience and the long-suffering, how it endures so much. Think about that. Think about, uh, I want to say his name, I don't go, George Soros, wicked as the devil. Wicked. Jew. Literally became wealthy through forsaking his own people to Hitler. That's his biographical sketch. Look it up online. Gained all the lands and things that he sold in Germany. Become the millionaire that he... Now he's probably a billionaire, no doubt. But all of his prosperity, he's done so ruthlessly. And yet, he's still alive, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Considering being the second largest media producer for news, and already said two things. Anything conservative is going off. I'm going to get them off. All right? Second thing, religion going off. It's just pure 24 hour 7 liberalism. Garbage. But we, I don't know why he wants to do that. We already got plenty of those. MSN, NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN. But anyway, no wonder the world's a wreck. Because so many people believe all their garbage. You'd be surprised how many people believe the advertisements in this election. Oh, I can't stand them. Oh, my soul. Oh, every time I see certain things on my TV, I'm going to take my foot and kick it. But, yep. but anyway, I, but I, aren't you glad I've not broken my TV yet? It means the Spirit of God still controlling your preacher most of the time. All right? Know what it is. I'm too tight to buy another one. <laughs> his patience, his mercy, his long-suffering ought to amaze every last one of us. Amen? First Peter says it so well, chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the suffering, long-suffering of God, listen to this, just found this verse today, when once the long-suffering of God waited, what does that mean? Patience. Standing off. Not immediately responding. How many times have you ever responded and when you did, you regretted the way you responded because you did it rashly and quickly before you really thought what you were doing. We say things, don't we, sometimes. Many people have hurt their wives or husbands or friendships and everything because they hastily say something ugly to get even, and then after the fact, they, they regret, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I really should have. Listen to what it says. When once the long-suffering long of God waited in what? In the days of Noah. Do you really understand what that verse is saying? All the years Noah worked on the ark. And by the way, that's a lot of years. Okay? God's patient endured. Now can I tell you, the days of Noah was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. It just went backwards again under Sodom and Gomorrah. You can't believe it. Think about it. You want to see how wicked the world was in their day? I have to say, America's not nowhere near Noah's day. Why? There's, there's more Christians, more righteous in America. I'm hoping, surely. I hope I'm not the only righteous one here. <laughs> All right? I don't mean that bragging on me. I'm just saying, I hope I'm not the only saved one here. Think about Noah's day. When he started the ark, he and his wife, maybe, and maybe the entire family already, only what? Eight souls believe God. Isn't that right? Hey, if all the people believe what he was preaching. By the way, what did he do for 120 years? He preached. He told them God was going to destroy them. He told them the world was coming to an end. They mocked. They scoffed. They scorned. They, they ridiculed. Ah, the old fogey. Man, he built a dumb boat down there in the desert and ain't nothing there. He ain't no water to float it. How you going to do that? Take care of that one day. And 
sure enough, it happened. And the evidence is on the rocks of every mountain and caves and on and on, the fossils of fish and animals and everything that is embedded in our... God, even though he dried it up, gave us evidence that there was a universal flood. And stupid scientists still deny it. Think about it. Sad. All their education, and yet they're pretty, can be pretty dumb. And while the ark was preparing, where in few, that is, eight souls, were saved by the water. I should say, from the water. Look at this verse. All of us know this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is, and thank God, long suffering to us, would not willing that any, not one, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I tell you, what you see in that slide is exactly what God came to do. Reconcile man back to himself through the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Man's got a problem. You see that there. If he's got a penalty one day, he's going to pay himself. If he doesn't get saved, get right with God, and he'll have to taste his own penalty for his sin and go to hell. But the good news is our hell has already been paid for. Amen? And our case with him has already been settled out of court. And I thank God for that. And you are too as well. Amen? And amen. Well, let me see. Did you give me? Yes, right here it is. I thought Gene gave this to me. Do pray for these tonight.